Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to welcome back Andrew Penn. He is a psychiatric nurse practitioner at Kaiser Permanente in Redwood City, California, and an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Nursing. Thank you for joining us, Andrew, and welcome back. Thank you for having me back, Jeff. I appreciate the invitation from you and from the International Bipolar Foundation, and uh, say hello to your audience. Wonderful. All righty. All right. So thank you for that introduction. Um, so I am, uh, just as a, as a note of introduction here, I am from San Francisco. And sometimes when I speak about cannabis uh, in, in other parts of the country, people assume that, that uh, being from San Francisco must mean that I am, um, I am an advocate for cannabis, which uh, I'm, I would say I'm more agnostic about cannabis. But I have to say that my city is, is wonderfully progressive. My state was the first state to have a medical cannabis uh, law. And it is also the, the city where an entrepreneurial Girl Scout uh, in, I think it was 2014, set up a stand outside of a cannabis dispensary and uh, was able to sell 117 boxes in two hours, which I find wonderfully uh, charming. Um, so I want to, uh, this is one of these sort of perfunctory slides uh, that says that I don't have any financial ties to uh, the, the material that I'm going to be talking about. And I think it's worth mentioning why I developed an interest in this particular topic. As Jeff mentioned, I am a practicing clinician. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And um, working in, uh, in this field, and particularly working in California, I had many patients who were using cannabis. And like many people who were uh, trained in the past, uh, we did not get a lot of training on cannabinoid science. And so I really had to take it upon myself to educate myself about uh, cannabinoids and how they interact with uh, psychiatric medications, how they interact with psychiatric uh, conditions. And this is uh, very much a work in progress. And um, one thing I found that when I talk about cannabis is that I, I generally tend to offend everyone in my audience a little bit. Uh, my more conservative uh, professional colleagues often feel like I'm being uh, too, um, that uh, perhaps I'm endorsing the use of cannabis um, and people who are uh, regular cannabis users often feel like I'm too critical of the anecdotal data that is out there. And so uh, what ends up happening is I, I end up kind of upsetting everyone a little bit, which is probably not a terrible thing. Um, but I wanna just disclose that my, my primary interest was learning this information to uh, better help my patients. So let's just go over a brief bit of history about cannabis before we get into talking about how cannabis is used and then specifically uh, cannabis and bipolar disorder and psychiatric disorders. And my one of my main focuses today, which I'll talk a little more, more about in a moment, is uh, harm reduction as a way of reducing some of the potential risks of cannabis use uh, while trying to optimize uh, any benefit. So cannabis is obviously not a new plant. Uh, we have historical evidence going back um, over 4,000 years. Uh, that cannabis has been part of the um, Apaka III uh, of, of ancient medical practitioners for a long time. And interestingly, in, a, in kind of a parallel universe, uh, at the turn of the, the last century uh, into the 20th century, uh, cannab cannabinoid uh, preparations in patent medicine became very popular. And one of the reasons why, which sort of alludes to something I'll talk about in a few minutes, is uh, because at that time, uh, morphine preparations had become incredibly widespread and we're, we're having sort of an opiate crisis uh, again. Uh, there was one at the end of the, the 19th century and it was uh, cannabinoid preparations which were often substituted for, for these uh, opioid preparations. So you'll find old patent medicines that contain cannabinoids like this one here. Um, and then of course we get to the 1930s where there was this sort of demonization campaign uh, in the form of films like Reefer Madness and posters, propaganda posters like this. Um, this is also where you start to hear the word marijuana, uh, a word which you will rarely hear me use in this talk because marijuana 
was essentially using uh, tying this plant to Mexican immigrants at the time in a form of race baiting. And so that term um, became the preferred term, even though cannabis is the botanical name for the plant. So of course we all know about the 1960s. We know we had a presidential candidate who um, apparently uh, tried it but did not inhale. And then we move into the 1980s with uh, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. And I call this the demonization of cannabis um, where the drug became sort of vilified and increasingly prohibited. And then we move up into the 90s. So 1996, as I mentioned, California was the first state in the union to pass a medical marijuana law. And we ended up in this sort of gray area where there was uh, the allowance of using cannabis for medical reasons, but oftentimes those specific medical reasons were not uh, they were not listed or they were, but then there was usually a provision that said, and any other condition which cannabis might help, which sort of opened the door to a widespread use of cannabis for, um, for any reason that a physician felt was a uh, reasonable use and would uh, provide a, a letter which would allow a person to go to a dispensary uh, because it is a schedule one um, sub substance under the Control Controlled Substance Act uh, a physician is not able to prescribe uh, plant cannabis. So I call this kind of the, the canonization of cannabis. And then we move into the more recent decade where essentially this uh, then moved, this medicalization of cannabis moved into this sort of de facto legalization. And we had, uh, we've had at least two presidents since then who have uh, admitted to using cannabis. I don't know about our current one. Uh, I'll refrain from comment on that. Um, and now we have multiple states that allow for recreational cannabis. So that's sort of been the trajectory of cannabis for the last 4,500 years in a nutshell. But we're in this kind of funny gray area because as I mentioned, cannabis still remains as a schedule one drug under the Controlled Substance Act, which means it is illegal under federal law, um, even though many states have decriminalized or outright legalized the drug. And clearly, uh, we've, we've sort of passed a tipping point uh, with popular opinion about this drug. We now have, um, this is the, uh, the Gallup poll that in 1969, only 12% of, of Americans supported legalization of cannabis. And we're now past, well past the 50% mark into 64%. And even Republicans have now passed the majority level at 51% supporting uh, uh, legalization of marijuana. And just in the last week that we've seen legislation uh, brought through by these uh, three senators led by Cory Booker um, to either decriminalize, um, well, largely decriminalize, and in some cases uh, to expunge past uh, convictions for cannabis possession. And in the strangest turn of events last uh, month was John Boehner, who was the former Speaker of the House, uh, Republican apparently has uh, now uh, changed position and is in support of uh, decriminalization of cannabis. Interestingly, at the same time that he joined the uh, the board of a uh, cannabis, a for-profit cannabis company. So we're living in very strange times. Um, and we see this reflected in this sort of patchwork quilt of state legislations. The bright green states are states that allow for um, recreational cannabis, dark green for uh, medical cannabis in the gray states uh, having no laws, although there are a few that have decriminalized possession. So we now have more than more than half the states with some degree of cannabis legalization. And this is a very um, fast growing industry. Uh, currently the, the industry is worth about $7 billion. And in just the next few years, that is expected to, to expand many fold. So there is what some people call the, the green rush of, uh, of money going into this business. Um, and I think while uh, you know, cannabis may very well have uh, a number of benefits, I think we need to be uh, reasonably skeptical and remember that, uh, that there are people that are making money uh, in this industry and um, are not necessarily interested in having uh, data to support claims. It's a, it's a lot uh, easier to make claims that, that don't necessarily have uh, robust scientific data to back it up. So, um, so this is sort of how it used to look in California. 
we had these sort of uh, very much of a cottage industry of uh, dispensaries that were permitted to uh, advertise and sell cannabis for a variety of medical purposes. And um, just recently, you know, the, the industry is getting a lot more sophisticated. And I, I found this this fantastic ad, which I'm hoping will, will work here uh, for a dispensary in, in Oregon. So let me let me just go ahead and see if this will work. And if it doesn't, Jeff will let me know. Sometimes life can be a little overwhelming. Sometimes the weight of the world can be too much to bear. Sometimes you need to stop worrying and take a deep breath. Sometimes you need cannabis. Introducing Brightside, high quality cannabis delivered right to your door. Brightside offers an extensive menu of strains and products to meet your needs. Choose the experience you want and we'll send you the dankest herb. The real sticky icky some top shelf marijuana if you like what we send you keep the whole jar we'll even include some milks for you to blaze as part of discovery you'll get to try new strains and products side effects may include euphoria increased appetite uncontrollable giggles elevated sensitivity to musical dopeness and reduced anxiety tetrahydrocannabinol may also induce feelings of existential well-being and relentless optimism with a bright side subscription you can get it once a month once a week or whenever you want all at a price you'll like. And yes, this is a real company. Do you know who I am? You're the wizard. Ask your doctor if cannabis is right for you. It probably is. Keep it right side. So we have the, the cannabis industry taking a page from the pharmaceutical industry um, and, and taking what I think is kind of a, a funny little shot at a, a typical uh, drug ad. But, you know, I think what that really demonstrates is that we are living in a changed world. And regardless of what the federal laws are around cannabis, we really do live in a post-prohibition world. And for clinicians to be um, sort of citing the, the legal status of cannabis is a reason why somebody shouldn't use it is really a argument that doesn't really hold much water anymore. So um, so this is the, the place where I operate from, which is uh, assuming that uh, patients may very likely use cannabis. And unfortunately, this is a lot of times what this conversation looks like uh, from when I talk to colleagues is uh, this. So we, we start out with a We've got a little scenario here with a clinician talking to a patient um, and asking this question. And even from the so right out the gate, this isn't this isn't going well. Uh, so we've got a difference in in nomenclature. Um, the the clinician using the slang, uh, patient using the botanical term, and explaining how it helps his sleep and his anxiety, and offering up that that perhaps sometimes it makes him a little bit paranoid, so that there are some side effects to the drug which the clinician then focuses on and uses that as a reason why the patient should stop using it. At this point, we're losing the patient. The patient is now uh, kind of leaving the conversation and the, the uh, clinician is rapidly losing credibility. And exasperated, the patient says, you know what, I'm gonna do what I want. And unfortunately that patient then gets uh, tagged with this idea that they are non-compliant. So we'll come back to this in a minute. So as I mentioned, the, the focus that I take is one of harm reduction. And so harm reduction says that any reduction in use, any uh, delay in use, uh, any safer route of use is better use. That reduces the harm. Um, ideally, if somebody's not using, that's uh, all the better, but many people are not ready to stop altogether. And uh, we wanna have something that allows people who want to reduce the uh, potential attendant harm of the substance, uh, also an option besides abstinence. So in this, I focus on understanding how the drug works, uh, changing the pattern of use and avoiding attendant risks. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the nomenclature around cannabis, the botany. So there, cannabis is the, um, the genus of the plant. And as you remember from your high school biology class, um, organisms are identified 
by their genus and their species. And so sativa and indica are the two primary species that we see of cannabis. So you'll hear cannabis referred to as sativa or as indica. There's a third species called ruderalis, which is um, sometimes hybridized into these plants. And so oftentimes now the genetics of sativas and indicas have been blended. Um, and so these distinctions are somewhat um, academic, but sativas in general tend to have more of a stimulating, um, possibly anxiety producing mental kind of high tend to be a little higher in THC and a little lower in something called CBD, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Whereas indicas tend to have more of a physical high, tend to be more sedating, tend to be more reducing of anxiety, um, can be lower in THC and higher in CBD. But as I mentioned, these plants are often hybridized and then they are um, cloned. So they're not grown from seed, they're grown from cuttings and they're cloned. So the uh, genetics can be reproduced uh, generation after generation. And these these different strains have uh, funny sounding names, um, things like Hindu Kush, um, Acapulco Gold, etc. Girl Scout Cookies uh, would be another, uh, would be a strain of a, a hybridized strain. And I kind of giggled when I first started hearing these names, but then I kind of stepped back and I thought, well, wait a second, I prescribe drugs with silly names like Abilify. So um, you know, I guess if, if you want to call your plant um, Bubba Kush, you know, that's probably no less silly than some of the pharmaceutical names that we use. But these are our ways of identifying the different, um, the different strains of cannabis. So cannabis, when we talk about cannabis, it's a very complex compound. Um, there have been over 550 different chemicals identified in plant cannabis, naturally occurring chemicals in the plant. And most of the attention is put on the cannabinoids, which uh, comprise about a quarter of the chemicals found in the plant. The most well-known cannabinoid being THC or uh, tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, CBD is another a cannabinoid that is getting a lot more of attention in recent weeks. Um, so that's CBD. And then there are things such as terpenes, which is what provides the characteristic odor and flavor of the drug and others. Now, one of the challenges with uh, cannabinoid science is understanding how these different chemicals play together. And um, there's something known as an entourage effect where the, the combination of different uh, components in the plant uh, work together to create the subjective effect of the plant. And so just taking out the THC or just taking out the CBD uh, may be interesting from a, from a science and from a marketing standpoint, uh, but may not be representative of what whole plant cannabis use uh, is like for the user. So just a brief review on how cannabis is used. Uh, the, the dry flower of the plant is referred to as bud, uh, often referred to as flowers now. And that's that picture in the top left corner. That is dried out and smoked uh, or can be inhaled in many different forms. Um, most common being the, uh, a pipe or a cigarette um, or a water pipe or a vaporizer. And then below we have the concentrates uh, the most common being these uh, oils that are often put in an electronic vaporizer or vape pen. Uh, kind of looks like uh, kind of like an old-fashioned 1920s cigarette holder, um, and uh, has an electronic heating element in it. There are other types of concentrates. Um, uh, hash was probably the the original one, and these various forms of extracting. The different cannabinoids out of the whole plant and then uh, typically those are heated and inhaled. Also cannabis is increasingly used in an edible form um, in, in, in prepared food products. It can be made into alcohol-based tinctures. It can also be made into topical uh, preparations which are then rubbed on the skin or applied through a patch for local relief of uh, pain and inflammation. So a little chemistry here. Um, the, it's a, it's um, the heat or drying process of the whole plant cannabis changes it chemically. It does something called decarboxylation. 
which makes the THC or the CBD or whatever cannabinoid we're talking about uh, more psychoactive, more, uh, more potent than if it was a um, fresh green plant. And it's, I find the uh, different weights of cannabis to be kind of confusing because the traditional ways, weight, weights that are used and uh, measurements for cannabis are often, uh, often commingle both metric and English measurement systems. So just to give a relative sense of what different quantities are uh, relative to those bottle caps there. So obviously an ounce is quite a large quantity of cannabis. Uh, a, a fairly common standard unit of, or, or me measurement of unit um, of cannabis would be the eighth ounce or an eighth, which would be the top right corner there. Also now, because of these, um, these cannabis oils, which are vaped, uh, that, that comes in different sizes. And so if you look at the label on this particular product, uh, you'll see the smaller one is a half gram of volume. The other one is a uh, one gram. And this is an 80% THC uh, concentrate. So this is a, a fairly potent um, vaporized cartridge and not an uncommon kind of dose. Um, it's also important to remember that cannabis is a very social activity. And so uh, if you ask somebody how much cannabis they use, they may say, I go through an eighth a week, but then if you say, well, how much of that do you share with your roommate or your spouse? And uh, it turns out that half of that is being used by the other person. So sometimes it's a little tricky to get a ballpark idea of how much cannabis somebody is using, but these provide me with at least uh, a relative idea. Um, and the other thing that makes measuring cannabis dosing a little tricky is that there's, ver there's variability in how much of the respective cannabinoids are in different plant strains. And so um, if you take a look at this uh, in terms of how many sort of doses uh, are in a, in a particular plant or a particular quantity of cannabis, I should say, um, and there's, there's some degree of disagreement about what constitutes a standard dose of cannabis, um, but typically anywhere between 2.5 to 10 milligrams of, of THC is considered to be a standard dose, 10 milligrams definitely being on the high side, particularly for an uninitiated user. Um, in fact, this came from a, uh, a cannabis dispensary, I believe, advising users to only use one to five milligrams and then to wait, um, because this is one of the biggest problems that people who are unfamiliar with cannabis get into when they ingest cannabis orally is they get impatient and take more before the first dose has begun to take effect and then end up having a, an unpleasant uh, experience of, of too high of a, of a dose. Um, increasingly, cannabis is labeled, which certainly makes it a lot easier to be a uh, consumer of cannabis because you have some idea of what you're ingesting. Um, now, there is some uh, doubt that has been raised about the, the accuracy of some of these labels. The, it's very much the Wild West with regards to the cannabis industry, and there are no, um, as far as I'm aware, governmental regulations about the, um, about the accuracy of these labels. And so uh, there has been a little bit of study of these and found that, if anything, the labels tend to over-report the content of cannabinoids in the product. So a brief note about how cannabis moves about the body. So when it's smoked, it gets very quickly to the brain and uh, tends to peak in the bloodstream at about 10 to 15 minutes after smoking it. Um, and the advantage to this is that it tends to be self-limiting and people tend to stop when they've had enough. Uh, the downside, of course, is anything that's inhaled can be uh, problematic to the lungs. Cannabis that's ingested, as I mentioned, uh, takes a lot longer to break down and tends to peak in about two to three hours. Interestingly, because it is broken down by the liver before it gets into the bloodstream, there is what's known as an active metabolite. Uh, so there's a breakdown product which uh, stimulates the, the cannabinoid receptors, the target of the drug in the brain which makes for a typically a longer effect of the drug and can sometimes have more intense effects. Now, um, the good news is that it is, uh, there's never been a documented cannabis overdose, unlike drugs like opiates. Uh, 
Um, now, that's not to say that a high dose of cannabis can't make somebody very psychiatrically distressed, but fortunately, because we don't have uh, cannabinoid receptors in the areas of our brain that control breathing and heart rate, uh, like we do for, for opioid receptors and respiration, uh, it's essentially impossible to uh, lethally overdose on cannabis. I won't belabor this because I think most people are familiar with the effects of, of cannabis, uh, but typically uh, users are looking for euphoria and relaxation. Uh, it's well known as an appetite stimulant. Certain strains can cause drowsiness, which many users uh, appreciate for sleep. Uh, there is this kind of enhancement of sensory and novelty experiences and a distortion of time. Uh, the respiratory irritant effects of cannabis are uh, pretty well known, and uh, it is pretty uh, well known to cause an increase in heart rate. And we'll talk more about the cognitive and psychiatric uh, risks of cannabis in a moment. So I want to just talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. Now, endo means within. So what this means is that inside of our bodies, inside of our central nervous system, we do have uh, receptors for cannabis. And as the person who discovered THC, uh, Rafael Machulam, uh, once quipped that it's very unlikely that nature would uh, make a receptor so that a kid in San Francisco could get high. And so it raises the question, if we have a receptor for this, why do we have receptors? And what does our body naturally make that goes into those receptors? So what I have here is kind of a schematic of a synapse You've probably seen pictures like this before. And the usual way that this works is that the upstream neuron terminal, the presynaptic neuron that's labeled there, releases neurotransmitters uh, into the synapse, the gap between the two uh, between the two nerves. And they float over to those little V-shaped receptacles on the other side, which then send the signal downstream. Um, so those neurotransmitters might be serotonin or dopamine, uh, et cetera. Now, what's interesting about the endocannabinoid system is that it goes the other direction. So it, call, it, it creates something called retrograde signaling control. So, the, um, so normally we've got this response. Now that red V-shaped receptor on the upstream side, that is, an, that is a cannabinoid receptor. Uh, so there's two types that have been identified, CB1 and CB2. And the endocannabinoids like anandamide are created on the downstream side and they go, uh, they go back upstream. And what they do is they tell that presynaptic neuron to hold on. So it's a little bit like if you've ever had somebody, uh, had a bunch of friends come over and help you move and you've got a bunch of boxes that need to get into the truck and instead of everyone just carrying one box out at a time, you make like a, a bucket brigade. Um, but the person in the truck says, oh, you're going too fast. And that message gets passed back down the chain. Uh, this is a little bit about how the endocannabinoid system works. And so what it does is it helps to kind of fine tune other neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, et cetera. Um, but that is also where exogenous or outside the body uh, cannabinoids such as THC and CBD target uh, those, those receptors right there. So why do we even have this? Um, well, you know, it's thought that the endocannabinoid system helps to regulate uh, the relaxation and sleep, which certainly makes sense uh, how many people uh, find cannabis useful for helping their sleep, helps with appetite regulation in the, um, in the brain, um, with pain modulation, and interestingly, also with memory and forgetting. And you might wonder, well, why would the brain need to forget things? But the reality is, is many things that come across our awareness in the course of a day are not useful to us down the road. So for example, you probably remember what you had for dinner last night, but in a week you won't because frankly, it's not important. And if we were to hold on to all that information, our brains would just get cluttered up with a bunch of useless information. So it's thought that the endocannabinoid system may play some role in, um, in deciding what gets kept and what gets tossed out with regards to memory. And we can start to see where that might become a problem when we look at some of the cognitive effects of cannabis in a moment. Now, is how addictive is cannabis? Um, well, the good news is, is that it is, it, it is about as uh, dependency creating for adults as alcohol 
So about one in 10 adults who start using alcohol will develop a problem with it at some point in their life. And that is about the same with cannabis. So about one in 10 adult users of cannabis will develop what we would call a cannabis use disorder. Um, we've kind of gotten away from the term addiction as uh, we're trying to in psychiatry. Um, so it's certainly far less dependency creating than say something like tobacco. Now, the younger you start using a substance, the more likely you are to develop a dependency with it. And so that rate of dependency almost doubles when you begin using it as an adolescent. And uh, dependency is typically defined as developing a tolerance, having withdrawal symptoms. And it is important to note that people do get a physiologic withdrawal syndrome. Uh, typically consisting of anxiety, insomnia, loss of appetite, uh, headache that will come with stopping regular cannabis use. Uh, it's not dangerous, uh, but it certainly is unpleasant. And my functional use, uh, my functional definition for uh, problematic use is continuing to use a substance despite mounting problems that interfere with your regular life. So my take home message with this is the later one can start, uh, using cannabis, the less likely you are to develop a dependency on the drug. So I mentioned problems with cognition. Um, th there's mixed data on this, but the, the strongest data is that uh, regular cannabis use may have um, an impact on verbal learning. So being able to remember things that are, are spoken or written um, on attention and on something called attentional bias, which is essentially being able to take in information that may uh, contradict things that you already know. And so you can see where this can, uh, this might be problematic, say with somebody who's still in school. And acute intoxication uh, does create issues with psychomotor function, which is a concern for driving because uh, despite the sort of folklore that uh, stone drivers are safer than uh, alcohol intoxicated drivers, it's turning out that in terms of things like reaction time, that that's just simply not true. And the combination of cannabis and alcohol is particularly uh, problematic with regards to driving. So looking at some long-term uh, studies of, this is uh, this comes out of New Zealand, a, a group of uh, young people in a town called Dundin, who've been followed for a large chunk of their lives and they're now in their I believe in their early 40s. And this was a concerning finding that people that began using cannabis in adolescence and used it frequently, when they got to age 38, compared to their peers who did not use cannabis regularly, they had about a six point uh, drop in what would be expected to be their IQ, um, which may not sound like very much, but um, bear in mind, 100 is a is an average IQ, and when you get down into the low 90s, you're starting to to um, have sort of borderline intellectual functioning. So this is worrisome um, from a neurodevelopmental standpoint, and is one of the reasons why I really encourage my young patients to hold off on using cannabis for as long as possible. Um, this is really my take home message. You know, in a perfect world, if people could would use cannabis after the age of 25, I think that would be great. Um, I'd certainly settle for 21, kind of like alcohol. Although unfortunately the, um, the initiation age of cannabis is usually around 17. So getting more specifically to bipolar disorder, um, which I know the, the, this audience has a particular interest in. So substance abuse in bipolar disorder is very common. About 40% of people with bipolar disorder will develop a substance abuse problem at some point in their lifetime. And about 20% of 20% uh, of people with bipolar disorder will develop a cannabis use disorder. So cannabis is probably the most um, common after alcohol uh, substance that's used in bipolar, uh, people who have bipolar disorder who develop a substance use disorder, um, it's typically alcohol and then cannabis uh, in terms of prevalence. And this is a little bit of one 
a, a little bit of a daunting looking image here, but what this is is, a, is what's known as a meta-analysis. So looking at multiple different studies, asking the question of, is there a relationship between a substance use disorder, that's what an SUD is, and the age of onset of bipolar disorder, and finding that on average, uh, bipolar disorder started about three and a half years earlier uh, for patients who were using um, using substances. So uh, you go from uh, non-users, uh, typically for other first symptoms around age 24, and on average, it was around age 20 for people using substances. So the concern here is that uh, substance abuse may accelerate the development of a bipolar disorder if there is um, a particular vulnerability for developing such a disorder. And this is an interesting study that just came out maybe about a month ago, um, looking at what we call substance-induced psychosis. So somebody who uses a substance, um, could be alcohol, could be cannabis, could be amphetamine, and develops a psychotic disorder. This is often when people will get um, hospitalized for the first time with bipolar disorder if they develop a, a sort of manic psycho psychotic state. Um, and look, tracking those people over time and looking to see how that turned out. And it turns out that about almost half of the people who had a cannabis um, or an alcohol-induced psychotic disorder um, converted into either bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Typically, if they were going to convert to bipolar disorder, they did so within about four years. People who developed, who went on to develop schizophrenia, developed that illness uh, a little sooner than their bipolar uh, colleagues. So this is concerning because I certainly see this a lot in practice where I'll have a young patient who goes into the hospital um, having had a psychotic episode and and the question becomes, you know, is this going to clear up or is this going to be like this ongoing? Um, what, are, what are we dealing with here? And because this is often when we really don't know exactly what the diagnosis is yet. Um, and then when people with bipolar disorder are having symptoms, uh, cannabis users tend to remain depressed and manic longer than their, um, than their non-using uh, bipolar peers. So there may be a sort of amplification of symptoms and illness that occurs when people are using cannabis uh, on, with their bipolar disorder. I often hear from a lot of my patients who use cannabis that they use it to treat their anxiety, which is understandable given that um, cannabis definitely has this anti-anxiety effect or can. Um, it, it doesn't always, and that's part of the unpredictability of the, the plant, is that for some people, um, cannabis definitely reduces their anxiety and for some people it makes them more anxious. So that's very interesting. But you know, typically when we talk about anxiety, we talk about avoidance, avoidance of things that are um, anxiety provoking. And um, it's very common for people with bipolar disorder to have uh, concurrent anxiety disorders. And I want to bring your attention right to that orange bar in the middle, the social phobia, or also known as social anxiety disorder, is very common with people with bipolar disorder. So about 50% of people with bipolar disorder also report having um, some degree of an anxiety disorder as well. And social anxiety is a particularly interesting uh, area to look at because, as it turns out, this particular study found that about 30% of people who, adults who use cannabis, also had social anxiety disorder. Now, you might think, well, did the cannabis cause that, or did they start using the cannabis before, uh, because of their anxiety? And it turns out the latter is the correct one. So about 80% of those people with social anxiety disorder began using the cannabis, um, or sorry, they started to have social anxiety before they started to use cannabis. And I think this is particularly interesting because, you know, in a way, most, many adolescents, if not most, have a certain degree of social anxiety. It, I think it's developmentally normal as we get familiar with the world and we take on challenges that we've never taken on before, like uh, going and applying for a job or, taking an exam or asking somebody out on a date. And the way we get confident in those situations is through doing them over and over again. 
And um, so, of course, the first few times you uh, go apply for a job, it's it's terrifying. Um, but once you've done it a few times and you go through a few interviews, you you get the confidence that you can do it. But if you never, if you avoid uh, going through that discomfort, then you never develop the confidence that comes with success. And so my concern is that people that use a lot of young people that use a lot of cannabis to avoid the anxiety that comes with these sort of developmental milestones don't really get the confidence in meeting those milestones and can end up um, sort of stuck uh, at a developmental age that is younger than their chronological age. And this is when you get somebody who's you know, uh, in their late twenties and still kind of living at home because they haven't been able to go out and make some of those milestones. Um, you know, also noting that we are living in very tif- difficult economic times. And if you're saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans, it's also difficult to go make it in, your world, in the world too. So let's talk a little bit about cannabis as medicine. And it's really important to point out here that there is a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence. So a lot of people will tell you about how cannabis helps them. And I, I believe that these people's experiences are probably true. Now, the question is, uh, are they applicable to everyone? And this is where uh, clinical trials come in because you then can answer a more clearly defined question about the utility of cannabis. And I'll be the first to tell you that the scientific community is way behind the user community in understanding the benefits of cannabis. And this creates a lot of tension because, uh, and the reason for this is because the federal government has made it very difficult to study the benefits of cannabis for decades now, which means that we have a shortage of information about how this uh, drug can be used in a useful way, but we have a lot of anecdotal user evidence. And as Carl Sagan said, um, just because you don't, you haven't studied something doesn't mean it's not there or he put it more concisely, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. And so just because we don't know if something is helpful doesn't mean that it's not helpful. It just means we don't know if it's helpful yet. And so I would say that the uh, scientific community really needs to get caught up uh, with this and find out if these reports that we're getting from users are uh, indeed check out when, when studied under more rigorous conditions. So I'll tell you what we do know. So cannabidiol, CBD, that's the the other cannabinoid that I talked about um, earlier. Um, So it may, it turns out that this may actually have antipsychotic properties, which is really interesting because high THC uh, cannabis can actually cause psychotic symptoms. So this was a study that was now done a few years ago uh, comparing a, a cannabidiol, a high dose of cannabidiol to a drug an antipsychotic that's not actually available in the United States, but is widely used in the rest of the world called amisulpride. And finding that really in term, uh, comparing those two drugs on a number of different measures of, um, uh, of, of, schiz- of, of psychosis, that they were really pretty evenly matched. So the, the CBD worked about as well as the antipsychotic in this very high dose. And this was again replicated just a few weeks ago in a study of people with schizophrenia adding on a very large dose, a thousand milligrams of CBD per day versus placebo to existing antipsychotics and finding a reduction in both what we call positive symptoms in schizophrenia, which are things like hearing voices and having delusions, and also the negative symptoms, which are the withdrawal and the difficulty thinking, um, which both of those symptom clusters tend to be present in schizophrenia. Um, that CBD helped both of those domains when added to an antipsychotic. Now, I want to really point out the dose here because I get uh, this from a lot of patients that they will use CBD to manage some of their symptoms, but the amount of CBD that they're using is relatively small. Um, It's certainly nowhere near a thousand milligrams a day. And so one of the challenges in translating a study like this to my clinical practice is I don't, um, I have a hard time knowing uh, how a small dose of CBD works in these kind of situations when all I have is data for a very large dose. And it would be uh, very cost prohibitive for somebody to ingest a thousand milligrams of CBD a day. Um, CBD in high doses, again, 600 milligrams 
uh, in a public speaking task. This is um, a way of kind of eliciting anxiety where you, you have somebody uh, deliver a speech in front of uh, a panel of people who kind of scowl at them and ask them very difficult questions, like I hope you won't do after I get done talking here, um, in order to elicit an anxiety response found that CBD was, um, was helpful in reducing anxiety in that kind of social anxiety task. Um, and another repeat of that uh, study at different doses found an interesting finding that this moderate 300 milligram dose, uh, PO means oral, of CBD uh, reduced that anxiety in that same task, similar to one milligram of clonazepam, which is a commonly used anti-anxiety medication. But interestingly, the low dose, which 100 milligrams, um, and the high dose, 900 milligrams, did not have that same response. So this may be what we call a U-shaped curve response. Um, a lot of my patients use cannabis for sleep, and um, this is generally an area where um, I think a lot of them find benefit. Again, we don't have great data on this. Um, particularly cannabis indica uh, appears to be more sedating than sativa probably more helpful for sleep. Um, most of the studies we have um, mostly use what we call subjective, so what the patient says. They don't use things like a uh, sleep lab or um, uh, polysomnography, which measures how much sleep the person is actually getting. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine is recommended against uh, using cannabis for sleep apnea at this point. Um, it may be what happens with sleep with insomnia is a lot of people get really anxious about getting insomnia and they, they almost become kind of phobic of going to bed because every night they go to bed, they have uh, terrible insomnia and they, they, they're miserable for half the night. And so it creates its own kind of anxiety. And it may turn out that the cannabis reduces the anxiety around the insomnia, and therefore the person has a perception of getting better sleep. Um, and also when people have a lot of pain uh, that's keeping them awake, the reduction in pain may also help to improve their sleep. Very interesting study that just came out, uh, I think last week, looking at if there was a relationship between opioid prescriptions and the uh, presence of cannabis dispensaries in multiple states and found this uh, reduction in opioid prescriptions in states that instituted some form of a, a cannabis dispensary or at the very least a kind of program where you can grow your own. Now it's not clear what direction the correlation is here. It may turn out that the states um, that have been kind of clamping down on the provision of opiates, uh, people are kind of giving up on getting pain relief from their doctor and they're kind of taking it into their own hands and using cannabis. Um, so the direction of correlation might go the other way, but it does seem that this might be a way of reducing um, some of our opioid uh, use that is endemic right now. Uh, a lot of people ask me if there are interactions between the psych meds that they are taking and the cannabis. The, there is a limited amount of data on this, but from what we can tell so far, it appears that the interactions um, from a drug-drug standpoint uh, are relatively minimal, which is good news. Um, although I would say that you want to be thoughtful about that because if you're taking medications to reduce, say, psychotic symptoms, taking a cannabinoid, which potentially could increase psychotic symptoms, is kind of working at cross purposes. Um, now, a lot of people will tell you that they use cannabis as a substitute for um, more conventional pharmaceutical medications. This was a study done last year uh, looking at that, that very question. And as you can tell, probably pain medications are the most commonly substituted with, with uh, cannabinoids. But there are a number of uh, drug classes here that are interesting to people with psychiatric conditions, uh, including the anti-anxiety, antidepressants, and um, anti-psychotics um, down at the bottom here. They didn't ask about mood stabilizers, though, of course, all of you probably are aware that many of our antipsychotic medications also are mood stabilizing. But this, I see this in clinical practice all the time where people are using cannabis instead of pharmaceutical medications. And um, so let's return back to our, our, our made up patient here. Um, you know, this is often how our conversations tend to go in my field. Uh, we'll ask a patient how the medication goes and they'll, they'll offer, yeah, I feel a little better, but I've had all these side effects. Um, 
and we focus on the benefit and tend to not pay as much attention to the side effects and um and we because we do that we often lose the faith and trust uh and and connection to our patients um and the sad thing is a lot of times our patients don't tell us this they just vote with their feet and they end up uh, not coming back and they end up stopping the medications and so harm reduction really talks about having these kind of open conversations where all options are kind of on the table and information is freely shared and i would really recommend you check out this ted talk by this physician talking about why uh, this sort of ability to choose one's own medical treatment is very appealing to patients and why uh, cannabis is often um, why why the provision of medical cannabis often allows patients this experience of of having some say in their treatment. The challenge is sometimes the guidance that people get is kind of limited. So what I imagine is a is a situation like this where, um, or I'm sorry, actually this this is often how usually cannabis conversations go. Um, so where only the, the downside is focused on, and again, we lose the patient. I think I mentioned this earlier. Um, so what I'm trying to do, um, my little piece in this is try to try and educate my peers um, to help them have a basic understanding of cannabis science. And uh, in a perfect world, I would love for my colleagues to operate from a position of harm reduction uh, in which they are helping patients achieve their goals around substance use in a way that minimizes the amount of harm that is done. Um, I think it's helpful to remain both open-minded and skeptical, both providers and um, and patients, because you know a lot of times uh, clinicians are overly biased towards the negative aspects of cannabis use, and patients are overly biased towards the positive effects of it. And I think it's important for both parties to maintain an open mind and be willing to, uh, to approach it um, from a different angle. Um, another key piece of harm reduction is the longer you wait before using, the better. I often advise my patients, uh, because we have dispensaries in California, which often have a plethora of different products to choose lower THC, higher CBD uh, strains and products. And I would like to see us having conversations that, that look like this. So you can see from the very get-go, the clinician starts with a respectful question uh, that is respectful in asking the patient to talk about their relationship with cannabis and not using uh, slang terminology for it. Uh, and patient then offers up information that it's helpful to them, but is also willing to offer up that there are some downsides, there's some side effects, in this case, paranoia. Um, and she recognizes that there are both uh, pros and cons to it um, and starts to look for a place where the patient might be interested in uh, maybe making some adjustments. In this particular case, um, the patient is more willing to acknowledge that the side effect of cognitive impairment may be causing problems at work um, and offers up, could we take a look at your medications or could we take a look at what cannabis you're using in order to uh, maximize your benefit and minimize your side effects? And with this, we have an engaged, uh, engaged partnership. Um, just some resources here. This is an interesting website. Um, again, I don't have a financial tie to this, but this is called leafly.com. And this allows for somebody to take a look at the profiles of these different strains, both their cannabinoid, uh, the, the, their genetics, uh, the cannabinoid contents, and the subjective effects. So this is sort of crowdsourced uh, from different uh, users of leafly.com and you can see this is the sort of the benefits that are attributed to this particular strain um, what the what people will use it for and then what the negative uh, side effects of it are and also the uh, cannabinoid profile and I think we're getting towards the end here so here are some high CBD low THC strains which are uh, probably less harmful if somebody is going to continue to use cannabis. Um, and in general, I just ask people to be thoughtful about where and when they use it, you know, and I say, if, if you wouldn't drink alcohol here, uh, would you, 
does it make sense to use cannabis here? So when somebody's in school uh, or working or trying to take care of their kids, um, I, I think those are areas where perhaps using is, uh, is not indicated. Um, and also paying attention to where and when somebody uses so that if there's a particular situation that is triggering use, we might be able to find other approaches to addressing that. And that really any, uh, any reduction in use is generally considered a step in the right direction. So I, that's what I've got. Um, thanks again for having me, Jeff, if you can still hear me. Thank you. Okay. I'm here. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions and answers for the next 10 minutes or so. Awesome. Okay. So we have time for just a few questions. Um, and as I've been watching a lot of the questions that were submitted, you've answered a lot of them. So that was great. Very thorough. Um, let's see. The first question, let's start about the patient to therapist relationship. Um, here's a good one. The first step in talking to your therapist, what's your advice? The very first step. Um, well, you know, I would say turn the interviewing table around. So most of the time when, when we are um, patients, we're used to um, being asked questions and being expected to provide answers. I would say flip that around and say um, to your clinician, uh, can I ask you some questions about your, um, your thoughts and feelings about cannabis? And, um, and, and ask, the, ask your clinician um, what they what they know about cannabis, um, how familiar they are with it, and if they have any particular particular concerns or biases about that. I think that's a reasonable thing to ask in interviewing a, a, a clinician. Great. All right. Um, let's see. Here's another good one. So I'm trying to word it correctly for you. So with tolerance and upping dosages, go hand in hand is there any warning signs when any specific warning signs when it's gone too far well you know tolerance is is a a known effect of many drugs and so really what the body is doing is it's it's adjusting to the regular presence of a substance in our body and so um you know many of us have a relationship with with caffeine and I certainly remember as a teenager, caffeine would make me, um, you know, silly, giddy, and, and hyper. And now I just drink it every day, and it really doesn't doesn't do that. So I've clearly developed a tolerance to it. If I stop drinking coffee, I get a headache and I get irritable, and so I get a withdrawal syndrome. Um, and so it, it's to some extent an expected effect. the The challenge with tolerance is that the more tolerant you become, the more likely you are to have uh, an uncomfortable withdrawal when you stop. And so, so that really is the risk of, of uh, developing a tolerance is that um, you're that much farther away from zero, if you will. And um, when you stop, you're definitely uh, likely to have some more discomfort. Um, ideally, you know, tapering is the way that, that we reduce withdrawal with most drugs. A lot of times when people stop using cannabis, they stop at cold turkey. And that often leads to a lot of discomfort. And I try and, if I know we're going into that, if a, if a patient of mine has decided that they're going to stop altogether, I will uh, try and anticipate things like insomnia and nausea and provide appropriate treatments like uh, something like trazodone for sleep um, or ginger or a medication like Zofran to help with nausea and appetite issues as the person comes off. Typically, the withdrawal is worst for the first three or four days and then gets progressively better. But sometimes people do have a certain degree of withdrawal that can go on for a week or two. All right. Um, okay. So that's, let me see. We, we have some more. So, and I, and I don't want to get too specific into the question. So if anybody has any general questions, submit them now. Um, let's go with, and I know you provided resources, so here's a good one. Um, any advice in finding therapists who, or I guess I should say, any advice in finding a therapist who is comfortable talking about cannabis with patients? Hmm. So is there a list? Yeah. Is there a... You know, it's, it's, that's a great question, and I don't have an easy uh, answer for that. Um, you know, it would be 
it would be helpful if there was an association for um, for clinicians who are uh, more neutral or, or at least open-minded about uh, partnering with patients who use cannabis. I mean, really looking for, for people who uh, practice from a harm reduction or what's sometimes called a motivational interviewing uh, approach, uh, which is where you're trying to partner with a patient to find what they uh, what goals that they have, uh, which may or may not include uh, abstinence from the drug. So I think, you know, like like finding any clinician, there's there's a sort of a, a feeling out process that, that begins probably on the phone when you call to make an appointment mm -hmm. um, and asking these kind of questions about um, that particular clinician's uh, interests and biases about about cannabis. All right. So it looks like we're just running out of time here. So I will be posting this video, um, this webinar to our website and to YouTube. So if anybody has any remaining questions for Andrew, go ahead and write them in the comments there. Um, and I'll do my best to pass them off. So um, like I said, if you or anybody you know has missed today's webinar, a uh, part of today's webinar, um, go ahead and check out our website later today or tomorrow and it will be posted. I want to thank Andrew for joining us today for what was a fantastic and informative webinar. Um, and, and yeah, so please be in touch if you have any other questions about the webinar for IBPF. But in terms of that, we are good for today. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Thank you for the invitation, Jeff, and uh, I appreciate your audience's attention. Wonderful. And I will be in touch in a few minutes. All okay. Right. Very good. All right. All right. Bye for now. Bye.